Hi, I'm Beryl, and the theme for today's video is in part two. We're gonna do another dish that I wish you knew about. I did this once before, and I thought that the video was amazing. I loved learning about dishes that are more than just kind of clickbaity YouTube foods. And so we're gonna do it again. <laughs> The artist for today is named Isa. He is from Indonesia. I loved his art because of how colorful it was. He said that some of his biggest points of inspiration are mythology and lettering, and I thought that his work was so cool. I'm very excited to share it with all of you. Okay, let's start. And we're gonna start with the one that I'm most nervous about because I don't wanna build it up. I just wanna do it. I'm just gonna do it. It's raw pork. Hi, my name is Katharina and I am from Bochum in Germany. When people think about German food, they usually think about sausages and beer and sauerkraut. And they are not wrong since we love these foods, but I think they are not very original since a lot of countries have their own sausages and their own kind of pickled vegetables. So. I wish people would think about Mettbrötchen when they think about Germany. Mettbrötchen literally means ground meat, red roll, and I think this explains the dish very well. It is usually ground pork, which you spread on a bread roll together with butter, and then you can top it with white onions and a sprinkle of salt and pepper. The meat itself doesn't taste like much since it's not cooked or fried. So it's much better if you eat it together with the toppings. I used to be in a German carnival dance club and I used to eat a lot of Mettbrötchen together with my friends and it brings back good memories. Okay, raw pork on a piece of bread. I can do it. I'm not scared, I'm stronger than you. I just feel like this is everything that I was taught not to do. I found a butcher in Brooklyn who works directly with farms and he looked me in the eye and said I would be okay. So, just okay. Oh my God, I'm eating raw pork. The onion, <laughs> I'm trying, like, I'm trying to be cool about this. Okay, okay. The onion has really nice flavor and the white pepper is definitely a better uh, pepper, I think, on this than the black pepper would be. It's not bad and it tastes, like, it tastes nice. I don't know why it tastes nice. There's really not much on this. It doesn't taste bad. I just don't understand, like, why the pork has to be raw. But it's also not bad, but it's not bad. I can't help it, I'm still scared. Like everything that I know is telling me like, Meryl, don't swallow this. But I mean, I did, I ate, I ate half of this. I think that this dish for me is complicated because when I posted on Instagram that I was going to be eating raw pork, so many people were like, ah, like mech brochin, mech brochin. Like, like people were really excited. So this is obviously a beloved dish, but there's something for me, like I don't have that history with it, but it's also not bad. So I'm not really sure what I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm glad that I tried it and I'm glad that I didn't just say no. So. <laughs> Hi, my name is Heather MacDonald and I live in Sutherland in Scotland. Um, when people think about Scottish food, usually they think about haggis and deep fried Mars bars. But I can assure you that Scottish food can be a lot more interesting and some of the most tasty and comforting foods. The dish I'm going to talk about today is the simple but tasty kippers on toast, usually eaten for breakfast. Kippers are herring, which have been cured in salt, butterflied and then smoked. You can get them freshly smoked or in tins with oil. Just a slice of good quality wholemeal toast and a tin of kippers, drained and broken up slightly. 
Kippers are smoky and salty and a little oily. I like kippers because of their simplicity. They are a product of a time when preservation of food was secondary to the taste. Herring, the fish kippers are made from, played a huge part in the economic growth of Scotland. The herring boom had its peak in 1907 and the village in which I live was one of the biggest ports in Scotland. This may seem a strange dish to pick as one that I would like people to know about. I guess it's special to me because I only ever ate it when I was visiting my granny on the north coast of Scotland in a little village called Betty Hill, sat at her dining table, looking out at dreek fields full of sheep. Sounds gloomy, but to me, it's the most beautiful place on earth. I want other people to know about this dish because it's so simple and tasty and it's a bit of a change from porridge. Okay, we have kippers on toast, which is herring. And I thought that Heather said a lot of really interesting things about kind of the herring industry in Scotland. And I just, like, I didn't know about that. And I also didn't know about this toast dish. Yeah, it's good. This herring is smoked, so you have like a lot of interesting flavors coming through that are not just like that fishy, salty flavor. There's also this smoky, umami kind of richness to it. It's really nice. Oh, I got the whole slice of lemon. So sour. When I was going to film this, I called it Heather McDonald and the Kippers, and it does sound like a really cool band name. Now presenting, presenting Heather, Heather McDonald, McDonald and, and the, the Kippers! Kippers. <laughs> the crowd goes wild. I feel like my main takeaway from this is to explore the canned seafood aisle more because this is absolutely delicious. I'm into this a lot. And I never knew about it, so now I know a little bit more about Scottish food. Okay, next dish. Hello, my name is Alawatima, and I guess Casper. And I am originally from Georgia, and I also lived in Baton Rouge for a period of time, so I do consider that my home, but I currently live in the Midwest of the United States. So what is a food from my culture that I wish y'all knew about? Shrimp and grits, or as we say in the Gullah Geechee, scrimp and grits. The Gullah Geechee people are people that were enslaved and were taken from what we now know of as Sierra Leone, they were then taken over because of the knowledge of rice fields and swampy areas and they were put in the low coastal areas of the United States of America. And because they were so secluded and they were in the south and some of them were on islands, those people were able to really hold on to their African cultures. They were even able to create their own language that I speak that a lot of people in these areas speak known as Gullah or as Geechee. Uh, Geechee is a dialect of Gullah. So shrimp and grits themselves. What do they taste like? Um, good. <laughs> uh, very savory. I like for mine to be a little spicy as well. I think that's my Creole side coming up. For me, every time I eat it, I really feel like I'm connecting with my ancestors because it just shows how resilient they are. You know, because at the time, shrimp was something that people didn't want to eat. Slave masters were giving enslaved Africans the worst stuff. Grits were actually a gift from the Native Americans. And so the Gullah Geechee people took that and they took something that nobody wanted and they made a beautiful meal out of it. And I think that that's just sort of a metaphor in general for African Americans. Given nothing, it made something beautiful. And a lot of times, you know, people will say, and I think this is just so important, is that African Americans are not without culture. They are not without an African country to call home. They are a displaced African tribe. And that's how we look at ourselves. That's why we say we be the Gullah Geechee Nation, because we are. To wrap all that up, I hope that y'all really like it. I hope that you try some shrimp and grits. And hopefully when you eat it, you are able to connect with your ancestors the way that I'm able to. Okay, so I have shrimp and grits, which is a very kind of traditional Southern United States dish. I thought that Alawatima did an absolutely amazing job talking about the importance of this dish, not only to her, but to a lot of other people who have grown up in the United States. 
I have never actually made grits before. This was my first time. And I know that it's gonna taste really good because there's cheese in it and there's bacon and there's shrimp and everything in here smells amazing. Yes. Wow. There's this amazing like salty and sweet combination going on here. Spicy shrimp. I feel like this dish really embodies the idea of this episode of like the dish I wish you knew about. I think when people think about the United States, they don't necessarily think that there is a food culture here that is our own. But there are dishes that are both historically and culturally important to those who live here. And I, you know, this is just really a perfect example of that. And it's so good. <laughs> I actually didn't know that grits were a gift from the Native Americans, and I think that that is something super interesting to learn. I'm always learning so much from all of you. I'm so appreciative of that. Just goes to show that food is a great way to share our cultures and our stories with one another because by eating one another's foods, we can understand a little bit about one another. And it was delicious and fun. I literally cleaned my plate, all of it. Even one shrimp tail is missing. Did I eat it? <laughs> My name is Weilin and I'm from Penang, Malaysia. The stereotypical food when people think about Malaysia is obviously nasi lemak because that's our national dish. However, the dish that I wish more people would know about is actually called Oni in Teochew or Oni in Hokkien, which is a language that I'm more comfortable in speaking. Um, and it literally translates to taro paste. So oni is basically taro paste that has been steamed and mashed with lard infused with shallots um, as well as a sugar syrup and it's to topped with ginkgo nuts that has been boiled in pandan leaves and you have to use the leaves, you can't use the pandan extract for this. Oni tastes like a warm hug that you never asked for but you never knew you needed. It's just the right balance of sweet and savoury and the slight bitterness from the ginkgo cuts through to make you want another bite. What I like most about Oni is that it's not a super sweet dessert, which is perfect for me because I don't have that much of a sweet tooth. It also has a weirdly satisfying mouth feel that makes you want to cover every inch of your mouth with more taro. So I wanted to share this dish because I've realised that Oni, among with a lot of other dishes in Malaysia, is actually dying out. Even within my family and other people within the Teochew community, it's getting more difficult to order this dish even at restaurants and you definitely don't see it as often in weddings anymore because it's so labour intensive. I was at my grand auntie's house a few years ago over Chinese New Year's. She hesitantly brought up the fact that she made Oni, thinking that no one in our family would want to eat it because it's a hot Chinese New Year's Day and Oni served warm. When I asked for a giant bowl, you could tell that there was a pleasant surprise on her face and I'm guessing that's because she felt a sense of relief over the fact that there was someone in the next generation who had a true appreciation for this dish and, you know, by extension, wanted to carry on this legacy of preserving Oni. This is the last dish. This is or ni. I appreciate that Waylon said that she wasn't that into sweets, but that this was up her alley. I am also not that into sweets, so. Oh, interesting. It's like, kind of like a sweeter mashed potato dessert. These are flavors that I, have never had before. I, this used pandan leaves, I feel like the leaves are giving a earthy type of flavor. I've never had a ginkgo nut. They're very creamy and I don't think I've ever had just like mashed taro. I've had a taro chip, like fried taro, but I've never had taro prepared like this. It's got a lot of starch. When I was cutting up the taro, my knife was entirely covered in starch, my hands were covered in starch, everything was starchy. You know, the more I eat this, actually the more I'm getting into it. 
at first blush, I was like, whoa, like, what am I eating? Like, what is even going on here? Um, you know, down was up, up was down, but now I think I'm into it, but what, where did the onions go? In the recipe, I didn't know where they were supposed to go. Do you just, like, have the onion oil and then it, the flavor got into the taro that way? There's no onions in this, so, I don't know. I'm really glad that I got to make this and I got to try this. I thought that Waylon's story about how this dish is slowly disappearing is something that I think a lot of people can probably relate to, that there are a lot of foods in their culture that are slowly not being made as much. And for good or for bad, maybe some of these dishes are super complicated or they have fallen out of style, I still think that there is value. And especially in talking about it, you kind of give that value back. So I was really happy to be able to try this myself and experience it, because this might be the only way I ever could. Oh. <laughs> so that's the episode, and I hope that you guys liked it, and I hope you learned something new. The recipes are all in the description, and if you would like to do this again, leave a comment about a dish from your culture that you would like to share, and we can kind of keep doing these sporadically. I think that they're important. And while of course the clickbaity topics are really fun, I think that there's value in talking about lesser known and understood dishes from where we come from. So with that, I will see you all next week.